Brilliant. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Welcome along. I um, appreciate you dialing in um, this afternoon. So yeah, we, um, we, we're here today to talk about video, but this is a three-part series um, all about home theatre. So if you missed last week, you can go to snap1webinars.com, check out the previous session. That's all about the audio component of home theatre. Oh, it was a great session. It was really fun. We spoke about, um, you know, uh, qualifying the lead, overcoming objections, the, compo the audio components in a home theatre, sub placement, just a bunch of crazy stuff, AVR choices. So um, it's just really, really fun, really interesting um, conversation. So this is uh, the afternoon session. We've already done one this morning. Um, the morning one was a blast and um, you are going to learn so much today. So um, I guess let's start with a quick introduction. So my name is Dave Phillips. I work at Snap One. I work in product marketing. I've been in the uh, CI world uh, since the 90s and um, have always been messing around uh, one way or another in the world of home theater. Uh, JD. Yep. So uh, JD folks, I'm on the product marketing team. I've been at Snap for about two and a half years or two years. Um, uh, so I cover categories such as uh, video, uh, outdoor TV, uh, uh, cable and wiring as well as power. Um, yeah, I've been in consumer electronics one way or another for the past 15 years or something. Some of you have probably seen me do a presentation maybe in a former life on TV before. So uh, if you have, welcome back. And if not, hopefully I've got something new for you. Is this something we can Google? <laughs> that's a great question. Maybe, maybe. I'd just like a link if that's okay. <laughs> uh, Jeff. Hey, uh, I'm Jeff Marks. I'm General Manager of Marketing for JVC. I've been doing this for a couple of days now. Um, professionally since the eighties. Um, but, uh, you know what, uh, today, what we want to do is make sure that we touch on some very broad brush strokes. Uh, you're going to hear about, uh, uh, a lot of different things and, uh, JVC, uh, will be giving you, uh, the contact information for both Patrick, Chris, and I, uh, to be a reference for each and every one of you. So Chris. Hello. I'm Chris. Uh, I'm Chris Deutsch. I'm National Product Training Manager, and I'm uh, thrilled to be here. Patrick? I'm Patrick Siebert. I've been with JVC for about six years now, uh, and I am MRI and All Nets rep as far as SNAP goes. So hopefully, if any of you are online now that are have MRI or SNAP, please don't forget to get my, my email and phone number at the end of this to make sure that you have someone to contact at any time. Fantastic. Adam, you're up. Uh, Adam Gershon, as you can see from my lovely background, I am a SNAP employee. Uh, I've been with SNAP for a couple of years, been in this industry for a thousand years. Uh, I know I look good for that age. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. My responsibility is media distribution. Uh, I own all of our media distribution products and our conferencing products. Lovely stuff. All right, JD, you want to take us away? Sure. All right, so we'll go through a presentation here. We'll go through uh, several different slides uh, covering a few different topics. Um, but uh, please, please uh, uh, use the Q&A uh, feature <laughs> on your screen. I uh, want to try to make it uh, as interactive as we can, um, uh, given the situation. Um, real quick, can everyone see this first slide? Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. I will try to. Make that full screen. There we go. All right. So uh, real quick, we'll go over uh, kind of choosing your video tech, a little bit of uh, kind of the major technologies and technologies and TV, uh, quick comparison. Uh, we'll go over projectors and screens as they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, and then a little bit on media distribution. So kind of looking at, uh, you know, when you're choosing between TV and projector, I think the two obvious uh, considerations are going to be um, the size of a wall that you may have in a room. Uh, so thinking, you know, beyond a dedicated theater room and a rec room situation, there may be several dormers or doors in the way, like, uh, like my room here, um, where, you know, a TV is probably the, the easiest solution. Um, you know, you have some intersection, you know, maybe in that 80 inch or 90 inch space between the two where you, you have to make a choice. Um, you know, if you have a lot of light, a TV may be a good choice, but you can also control light if you have uh, 
uh, a way to control the light, then of course you can uh, move to a projector. Um, something else to consider is, you know, as easy as a TV may be to kind of hook up and hang, uh, if you're trying to drag an 80 inch or more TV through a hallway around corners and upstairs, um, suddenly uh, a projector is probably going to look uh, a lot better. Um, the other thing is, you know, even if you have limited wall space, if you also have to consider speakers, um, you can't hide speakers behind a TV. And uh, of course, there are ways to hide uh, speakers behind a projector screen uh, with acoustically transparent screens. Um, and also you can, you can hide a projector screen and projector with motorized uh, mounts and screens. So um, several different considerations to, to kind of go through. Um, the two major uh, technologies are obviously kind of LED and OLED right now. LED comes in lots of different flavors. Uh, the one that's on the premium side is going to be an LED with, a, with a, a layer of quantum dots for, for better color. Um, so we'll kind of compare those, you know, between the two technologies, you know, which is better, what, you know, when to use what. Um, you know, the OLED construction is a little bit more simple. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, ma to manufacture the actual OLED screen, but once you do that, um, it's a little bit more uh, simplistic because the OLED uh, screen actually produces its own light um, so that uh, it's, it's an actually emissive technology as opposed to an LED where you need uh, an LED light source. And then you have several uh, diffusers, filters, um, uh, I think a polarization screen, um, as well as the quantum dot layer. So you have a lot more going on. And so that makes it a little bit thicker. And then it's also, uh, you know, a transmissive technology. So since you have a LCD screen that shutters the light on and off, um, as opposed to actually turning individual little uh, pixels on and off like an OLED. So, uh, so what is that? What does that equal to you? Um, so, you know, depending on uh, what your light situation is, if you have a very bright room, you may need to go for a very bright LED solution. Um, if you can control the light or you have a, a basement room or something like that, uh, and you wanna choose a TV technology, OLED is probably the way to go. The reason for that is uh, usually when you're talking about uh, uh, critical viewing and picture quality, you're gonna go look at uh, contrast and your blacks. Um, the OLED, because uh, it is emissive, is that it can turn off uh, uh, sections of the TV essentially at a pixel level. So you can go completely black to an all white screen. Um, the, uh, the disadvantage, of course, is you can't get as bright uh, as, as an LED uh, in the current technologies. Um, so, you know, obviously the brightness, uh, like I just said, uh, you can go uh, very bright, a thousand nits, two thousand nits, whatever the case may be with an LED. Um, color, uh, it's going to go kind of from brand to brand and how they put it together. But with quantum dot, the, the total color palette is going to be, uh, and, and color space is going to be very, very similar. Um, another advantage is with OLED is going to be you're going to have faster response times because you're, you're firing at an pix uh, individual pixel level as opposed to shuttering an LCD. Um, viewing angle, again, because you don't have the shutters of an uh, uh, LCD, uh, it's going to be better with an OLED. Uh, lifespan, uh, right now, uh, L LED TVs are still better, um, and part of that also lends itself to the, the next issue is, is burning. So that can still occur uh, with an OLED, um, but there are ways to mitigate that. A lot of times it's just image retention will go away. Uh, and also there are some ways to use uh, programs within the TV, or you can use certain video solutions to uh, kind of counteract that. Um, power consumption tends to be OLED uh, because you're only lighting uh, part of the screen uh, and they're very efficient. It's a very efficient solution, um, but it, it still can be a little bit dependent on, on the content you're going to use. Um, I put a little image here on the right. Those are the, all the different levels or, or sorry, layers of an LCD screen. Um, so it just kind of shows you uh, all the stuff that kind of goes into getting from, from the light source uh, to creating a picture. So it's, it's pretty interesting if you've ever taken one apart. All right, so with that, uh, we'll go over, you know, projection. So if you do choose a projector solution, um, we'll let the JVC team kind of go through that and, and uh, tell you all the great things they have to offer as, uh, and, and projectors in general. Well, thank you, JD. Um, 
the uh, everybody got my screen? You got it. Okay, wonderful. So uh, first and foremost, if you have a question about anything that's talked about this afternoon uh, relating to projections, screens, uh, connectivity, please let us know. Um, we're here to we're here to help. Um, both the SNAP team as well as the JVC team is here. Uh, this training uh, is meant to be brand agnostic. Uh, while JVC makes uh, many different types of projectors or several different types of projectors and at various different price points, uh, we know that you have different, uh, there are different solutions out there other than JVC, uh, but the basics are all the same no matter what brand you do choose for you and your client. So um, without, with that being said, um, it's very important to note that um, when you talk about panels or you talk about projection, uh, one of the characteristics is, that is important is light uh, availability in terms of how many lumens is, how bright it is, and also the ambient light in the room. Uh, it's important to note that you can have a dedicated theater or you can have a multi-purpose room and you can put a projection screen in either one of those. It's the components or, or the products that you put with a projector that are gonna make all the difference in the world in terms of performance and the customer's ability to um, enjoy that uh, projector in the environment they're in and also setting expectations. One of the biggest things that we can do as is, is, is professionals in, in, in uh, custom integration is understand that people don't need this shit. It's family fun time stuff. It's stuff that people really, really want. And that's the cool thing about it. All we've got to do is manage your expectations and, and make sure that we deliver on that promise of family fun time uh, equipment and deliver the best performance. And a projector or flat panel can do that provided it's in the right situation. So as I said, there's dedicated home theaters, which are uh, completely light controlled. Uh, minimal, minimal windows or with a lot of shades, um, not, not a lot of ambient light, or there's rooms or multi-purpose rooms where people want to actually live in the room uh, and be able to accommodate that. It's the amount of lumens uh, that a projector can pr provide and also selecting the right screen material for each and every room. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But a projection system is so much more than just a, a projector and a screen. The other thing is um, when you install a panel, a 75 inch panel, some, and, and people say, well, you know, I want a little bit bigger. A lot of folks will think, well, 150 inch sc uh, screen for a projector will be twice as big. Not, not true. Twice would be 110 inch. So the average, the uh, square footage of a 75 inch panel, 16 by nine is 17 or 16.7 uh, square feet, 110 inches, 35.9 square feet. The other thing to consider is that when folks are buying panels or projectors, they expect to see certain things. They expect to see color. They expect to see contrast. They ex expect to see black level. Uh, they expect to see resolution. And also, they expect to see bright pictures. The reality is that um, if you're going to see 4K resolution on a panel, as a 75 inch panel, as an example, you have to sit 5.5 feet away from it or about five to uh, five and a half feet to eight feet away from the panel. Is that realistic in most homes? Are people sitting that close? Because that's how close you have to see, actually see the detail. On a 110 inch flat, uh, on a 110 uh, inch uh, screen with projection, eight to 12 feet is where you can see that resolution. Um, and uh, resolution is what you have to see when you're sitting close. Color and contrast are something that isn't dependent upon distance, but resolution certainly is. And eight to 12 feet is far more realistic um, to see what that, that customer is investing in. So that's, that's something to consider. So when you're thinking about putting a home theater in someone's home, whether it's in a dedicated room or it's in a multi-purpose room, a bedroom, wherever it's at, consider the size of the wall that you're putting it on. Consider to have the, what is the ambient light conditions of the room, making sure that you understand, and we'll talk about this in a moment, um, the different screen materials that are available to uh, mitigate uh, the light or lack of light. Um, there are better choices for others. Are, do they want to put the speakers behind the, the screen? You certainly can't do that with a uh, flat panel 
TV. Um, but in order to do this, you, you've got to understand some throw um, ratios we'll talk about, um, how to calculate brightness. Um, there are some additional skills that you would have to have to have a, a, a anamorphic or a cinemascope style screen available. Um, knowing that certain projectors have the ability to have lens memory. So you can have 235, 240, 239, 2.0, um, 16 by nine, all from one uh, projector. If you do use a cinemascope style screen, you're setting yourself apart from someone that's just a trunk slammer. It's going to go out and install somebody's panel on their wall with a, you know, less than $100 uh, uh, mount and leave the home. Um, this sets you apart for value added surface. This sets you up to be um, the person they're going to call when they got that, that projector and screen. Now they're going to talk about, well, you know, um, what else goes into this? Well, you're going to need to have connectivity. You're going to need to maybe want to have Adobe Atmos system. Um, you're going to, you may want to uh, have a system control. The bottom line is this. There are many, many, many different ways that you can value add to your customers. And it's not just by selling them something. It's the knowledge that you impart on that customer to make sure that they're entertained. Um, telling them what they need is so much better than listening to what they want. Think about it. People know what they want, but they have no idea what they need. You and I and the rest of us on the call are professionals, and we need to tell people what they need as long as it goes, can, there is a symbiotic relationship because of what they want. Telling them that, you know what, I want to put a 80-inch a, a panel on the wall, but when it won't go around the corner of a basement because the dang thing's too big, um, that's a problem. But you know, I have a solution for you, Mr. Customer. If you want a 120 inch screen, we can, we can bring a screen down those stairs because it comes in a small box and it's rolled up and I can bring it down the stairs. I don't have to make any tight corners. I can put that there. Wouldn't you rather have a much larger screen on doing that? So projection offers you the ability to make more money. It offers the client, your customer, um, to the ability to have much better involvement with that environment they call a home theater. People want to share that experience. And in order to share an experience, it's got to be big enough for a lot of people to be in the room. Um, you're not going to be gathered around a 65-inch TV in order to do that. You've got to have a, a larger screen. So that's one way of making sure that projection is going to allow you to have that. Now, the one thing no one's ever said is, I sure wish I had a smaller screen. I don't think anybody's ever said that. I don't think anybody's ever heard that. And the reality is the only way they're going to get a large screen is by going with projection. Now, um, average um, projector screens out there right now for most installs are probably between 110 to 130 inches in that, that range. Um, but there's not uncommon um, if you live in metrop large metropolitan areas um, where um, it may only be a 100 inch screen in a, an apartment kind of setting. It's still much bigger than a flat panel. Uh, and it is more enveloping. But again, remember, no one's ever going to tell you, man, I really wish I went with a smaller screen. Impossible. A dedicated theater. Dedicated theaters are, 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 are the, the cherry on top of the Sunday. Not everybody has the dedicated space for a dedicated theater. But at the same time, when they do, there's some things that you just need to know about having a dedicated theater. What's the right screen material? Um, as an example, um, a dedicated theater, you'd probably want to be looking at um, white screen material versus dark or, or silver or gray. You probably want to be looking at with a gain of 1.0 to 1.3 gain. Um, and as you go up in gain, 1.0 is unity gain and the, um, is a, uh, the reference point. And as you go up every point, point 0.1, 1 1.1 1 .1 would be 10% brighter, 1.2 would be 20% brighter, 1.3 would be 30% brighter than 1.0. Um, this will allow you to make sure that you get screen uniformity, your color purity that you want to have, while at the same time, high dynamic range content, which is so prevalent today in, in streaming and, and uh, everything else, people want to have that more dynamic image and HDR's way of doing that. Having a, sli a slight amount of screen gain would be preferable. So when you're dead, you're placing a home theater or make, designing a home theater, consider 
bat white screen, so 1.0 to 1.3 gain. Um, this is going to ensure that you get the, the, the best color purity uh, of the screen. And also consider that you can sit up to one to one and a half times away from the screen height. You can be immersed, you can be env enveloped. Gamers want to be enveloped with a video game. Um, and different projection systems will allow you to, to do that and in terms of the latency and so forth. And there's a lot of different things we can talk about. We're not going to get into the weeds on latency right now, but the, the faster it is, the less uh, lag time there is and more realistic the, the, the experience is going to be for gamers. But they want to be enveloped. They want to be immersed in that. And, a, and there's nothing better than that than a dedicated home theater or a multipurpose room on a projection screen. Now. People spend millions of dollars on their homes and their views, but at the same time, they live in those homes and they want to make sure that they not only see out their windows, but they can also um, have um, entertainment when they want. So regardless of what the room is, there's ways of putting projection in a room that not make it obtrusive, the big, single biggest thing in the system. Consider this, when you put a panel in someone's, in someone's house and hang it on the wall, that panel never goes away. That OLED or, or, or QLED TV sits on that wall. It's there all the time, morning, noon, and night. You walk in a room, it's the biggest thing in the room. But if you want to have that view, you can have a drop down screen. You can have um, a zero edge uh, product where it doesn't have a big bezel on it. You can have it where it just floats, uh, the appearance of floating. There's many different solutions for different screen materials in rooms. And that's one way um, to accommodate a customer. Now, in this particular example, this has a lot of ambient light in the room. Um, you'd want an ambient light rejecting screen, ALR screen materials. They're typically between 1.2 and 1.4 gain. Um, they're most certainly generally either gray, silver, or even black in some cases. This is going to ensure that the ambient light that's in the room that's coming from the reflecting off the ceiling or reflecting off walls or windows coming adjacent to the, the screen, the ambient light rejecting material um, takes care of that where it reflects that light, doesn't put it on the screen and only accepts the light that's coming from the projector, what's directly in front of it. Now, the one thing an ambient light rejecting screen can't do is differentiate, differentiate between light sources so if you've got a large window in the projector uh, projector that is pointing away from that large light source, that screen is going to tell the difference between um, the window light and the projector light. So it's always best to make sure that the light source is just the projector when, when using an ALR screen. But nonetheless, this allows you um, to actually use a projector in a more uh, an environment that is going to uh, be uh, more well lit. The one thing to consider when you're using it in a multi-purpose room, though, the more light that's in the room, the less contrast you're going to achieve from any projection system, right? Less contrast. And that holds true also with panels, um, because uh, if it's a bright room, you won't be able to get complete black uh, because of the ambient lighting conditions. So that's why a theater um, is optimal, because it, you, you can only get as dark as the environment's in, um, but brightness also plays a, a big part of that. Now. Um, when you want to have sound with your video, which God forbid, no one ever thought about that, um, you want to have that that Dolby Atmos and, and and so forth. But you don't necessarily want to have the designer or the homeowner doesn't want to have um, speakers left or right or, or below the screen. Um, you can get a acoustically transparent screen. Now, acoustically transparent screens um, have various different gains, say from 1.1 to 1.3. Uh, they can come in micro perf or they can come in a weave. Um, and this allows the sound of the speakers to be put directly behind the screen. So it's more of a aesthetically pleasing installation. Um, the, one, the one caveat from a video manufacturer standpoint of view, such as JVC, when you do use a weave or a micro perf, uh, you are going to compromise the resolution to a certain degree um, simply because they're um, and brightness because light passes through those holes or weaves as well as the fact the resolution um, does, um, I don't want to say suffer, but it's mitigated as, as to a certain degree because of the screen material. You want to have a very matte finish on a screen um, that is as smooth as possible. And this is why screens 
uh, range from hundreds of dollars to thousands and thousands of dollars is based on the screen material, the technology at ambient light rejecting, acoustically transparent, um, and, and so forth. So there's three basic uh, 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 screen materials that you would want to consider for home theater is one, um, dedicated theater, another one for ambient light rejection, and yet another screen material um, for acoustically transparent screens. Um, and those acoustically transparent screens come in black, white, silver, um, or it's gonna be gray and silver. I don't think it comes in black uh, in acoustically transparent, but you can use that in a theater or a multi-purpose room. The other thing to consider too is, you know, when you're talking to your, your potential customer, I think it's important to ask that customer, do you, do you anticipate this, this, uh, this environment to be mostly for TV viewing, mostly for movies or a combination of both? Um, because if they say, well, all I care about is watching sports and so forth, that's fine. So if they're only interested in sports and, and TV viewing, that's nine times out of 10 um, is 16 by nine. But also remember this, they forget that streaming is part of that TV experience and much of the streaming is 235, 240, 2.0, uh, not 69 by nine or uh, 1.78 to one. Um, it's important to call that out because if they want to get or not to have black bars on their 16 by 9 screen when they're watching that content, the only way to do that is by selling that customer, that client, a cinema scope style screen, 239, 240, 235 uh, scope screens. Now, why that's important is because it's going to be that widescreen experience. You're not going to have the black bars at the top and bottom. Um, the material is important. The gain is important, as well as what aspect ratio is important. So again, the only time a 16 by 9 screen should um, be really considered is if they're really just really interested in 16 by 9 content, or they don't have the width of the wall because there's a architectural reasons why you can't go with larger screens or wider screens because of the size of the wall. Um, or if you do, you have to go to a much smaller screen height and that means that on, on 16 by nine content, that image is much smaller. But the takeaway with all this is this, a projector can work in any room, all right? Um, this is a uh, just someone's, um, uh, um, I believe it's an attic space here um, where they've taken, um, where there's a lot of windows and, and, and so forth in this, but they've done a couple of things. They got an ALR screen. They've got a completely black wall behind it, which a black, a dark color on the screen wall is going to help with contrast. It's gonna help it disappear. And remember this too, guys and gals, when you sell a projection screen, Regardless of the amount of light that's in it during the day, it's always get dark, it gets dark at night. So even if it's bright in the afternoons, it's going to be darker in the evening. And that's when most people are going to be watching their home entertainment and listening to their home entertainment systems. So this is very important. Screen material and the projectors are very, very important. So let's talk about a couple of different things when it comes down to projection platforms which is right for me, which is right for my customer. What's the differences between these? Um, there's DLP, there's LCD, and there's LCOS. Now, a variety of different manufacturers make a variety of different um, products. Uh, in JVC's case, JVC pr uh, uh, promotes uh, DLP, and but our primary uh, uh, projector line is made up of LCOS projectors. We call that DILA. Um, DLP uh, projectors, are going to allow a, a fair amount of brightness. They're gonna give you a great color and they're also gonna give you brightness and color together. Um, DLP projectors, some of the cons of a DLP projector, most DLP projectors are not native 4K. Well, they're 1920 by 1080 and they use pixel shifting uh, on that. I'm not gonna tell you pixel shifting is bad at all because JVC actually developed, uh, pioneered pixel shifting technology for projection many years ago. We called that E-shift. Pixel shifting is a way of making sure that you get more resolution, um, um, uh, addressable resolution out of a uh, non-native 4K device. Uh, the one major drawback of DLP though, is that 
um, DLP or digital micro mirror devices work on hinges and they, the, those hinges, those mirrors um, can actually cause a rainbow artifact uh, due to a color wheel. Um, once the client sees it, they're always going to see it. Once you see it, you're always going to see it. And there's nothing that's going to make it go away. There's nothing wrong with the product. It's not a warranty issue. It is what it is. It's a function of the platform. Um, LCD um, is another platform, um, and primarily from the and the, primarily in the uh, consumer electronic space in the custom integration inst installation space. Epson pretty much is the brand that uses LCD. Um, and many of those projectors, again, are not native 4K. Um, they have the potential for great blacks. Um, they're relatively inexpensive in terms of their price point. Um, and there's no difference between color and white brightness as there is um, with uh, uh, DLP. The third platform for projection is what JVC and Sony both use, and that's LCOS, liquid crystal and silicone. Uh, JVC uses the term DILA, direct drive image light amplifier, and Sony's is called SXRD, both uh, very similar platforms. The LCOS platform, um, those projectors are all native 4K, so 4096 by 2168 resolution. Those are 17 by nine chips, both on JVC and Sony. Um, and next week we'll be talking about some of the differences when installing these, because we have a, uh, a part of the, the series next week where we're talking about installation of both audio and video. And we can talk about how best to set those up and, and ways to do that. So just a plug for next week's um, uh, webinar. Um, LCOS is the preeminent platform for contrast. And contrast cannot be understated and it cannot be overstated. Contrast is the single most important thing in image quality. It's the thing that makes it more, more dimensional. It makes it rich and thick and velvety and bright and, and, and it's almost like you can stick your hand into it. Contrast is what makes picture quality pop. Yes, resolution is super important. Yes, color is important. Yes, brightness is important. But the reality is contrast and LCOS is the way to get the most contrast out of it. But again, um, to get the most out of that contrast, you do need light control in your environment, whether it's through shades, whether it's through dedicated um, rooms that have very little light. Contrast is what's gonna make that image best and, and, and pop and LCOS is a way to do that. Um, the cons are, honestly, LCOS costs more money to manufacture than both DLP or LCD projectors. So um, there's a variety of different options. Snap carries a many of the various different brands um, that are um, highlighted here. Um, and the Snap Locals also carry uh, different brands. So um, as I said before, we're trying to make this as brand agnostic as we can. Um, but the things to remember with any image quality, the things to remember with any panel or projector is, uh, as JD talked about the difference between Q, uh, QLED and OLED. Um, these are all aspects of projection that make a difference too. So in resolution, um, the resolution advantage is, is going to go to uh, any platform that uses native 4K devices. That would be LC, that would be uh, LCOS. Um, black level and contrast. Again, I've explained that the, the, the leader in that platform is LCOS uh, with LCD and then DLP being third. Uh, again, this is by, by virtue of what the, the platform's um, abilities to reproduce um, color quality. It's a draw. Um, it depends on the brand. It depends on the model, uh, the, where it falls in the manufacturer's line, how much of the color spectrum it reproduces. Color quality really equates to color, um, how many colors it reproduces, all right? Um, there's three various different um, um, color quality uh, uh, references, uh, Rec 709, which would be SDR content, uh, DCIP3, which most um, HDR content is produced at, and then Rec 709 for HDR content. Um, but again, everything is in the DCIP3 packet. More colors equates to more realism. It gives you, uh, uh, and it also is going to give you better or uh, lifelike color. So color quality, by platform, there isn't a significant difference between any of them, but it does vary between manufacturer and manufacturer. 
and it does vary, vary between model and model with each of those manufacturers um, lines. But the platform in one isn't better than the other. And then finally, um, brightness is so very important. Um, DLP projectors um, tend to be brighter because they cost less. Uh, and some projectors, and this is measured in lumens. Um, now, um, if you're going to have a projector for outdoors, all right, um, you'd probably be looking at well over seven to 10,000 lumens on a projector, all right? You won't find that in LCOS, you won't find that in LCD, you only find it in DLP. Um, so the advantage may be for DLP because of the amount of lumens that the projector can produce, not the picture quality that it can produce. The second would be LCOS. Um, JVC, as an example, our, our, our projectors range anywhere between 2,200 lumens, um, 2,500 lumens, and 3,000 lumens on our uh, LCOS uh, projectors right now. We also have a 3,000 lumen LCOS uh, projector uh, in DLP. Um, so that's a, that's a possibility. And then uh, DLP uh, uh, would be, this. that's a typo, by the way. Um, uh, in here. Um, so I apologize on that. When we talk about illumination, a projector is either illuminated by a laser or it's illuminated by a lamp. Um, and up until recently, the marketplace um, has had um, lower cost laser projectors or higher cost lamp-based projectors or lower cost lamp-based projectors. There's been a dramatic change in technology over the past couple of years and laser projectors are becoming more the norm. Um, they're also more expensive than lamp-based projectors, but nonetheless, there's some significant advantages going with laser versus lamp. Um, one advantage is there's, when you go with a the laser, there's no replacement costs. There's no, there's no cost of ownership over the course of the lifetime of the, the projector. Uh, lamps um, can go, a lamp, a new lamp every 35 to 4,500 hours may cost you anywhere be upwards of $600. Um, a laser um, at 20,000 hours at um, high lamp or laser output in JVC's case, I'm gonna use JVC numbers here. Uh, a JVC laser um, at high uh, diode output at 20,000 hours is going to last you about four hours a day for five days a week for 50 weeks a year. So that's about 20 years for that illumination source to last. Um, the other thing is laser can also um, be less expensive to operate. It can be also not as warm or hot, thus fan noise is reduced and also the uh, amount of money to operate it is also greatly reduced as well. Um, there's very few cons of, of laser uh, projectors, with the one exception being that um, it may cost more than a lamp base. Now, a lamp based projector uh, doesn't inherently mean it's, in, it's inferior to laser by any stretch of the imagination. Um, lamp based projectors have been around for years and years and years, and the quality of lamp based projection is extremely high. I um, mean, even in JVC and in, in my uh, uh, counterparts, uh, Sony, have laser uh, lamp-based projectors that are extremely high in quality. Um, the reality with lamp-based though is it costs more to operate it. Um, the the uh, other thing is lamps do decay. Um, and it's not as bright as it was today as it is gonna be a year and a half from now or two years from now, just depends on how much you use it. But again, lamp-based doesn't make it any better or worse. Um, it's, it, it has to do with um, power consumption, heat, um, fan noise, other things like that. But again, it all depends on the budget. So those are the two different ways you, that uh, basically can be illuminated. Um, the other aspect of, of illuminating a projector uh, and getting best picture quality is we've talked about contrast, we've talked about color, we've talked about brightness, um, we've talked about resolution. And all these things come together when you put the uh, high dynamic range content into play. Now, HDR content is 
truly the best way to get the most out of any product every time you turn it on, provided it can play H reproduce HDR content. Now, HDR is by name, high dynamic range, meaning the peak whites are brighter, the deep blacks are blacker. And when you see that on the screen at one time, you're gonna get more dynamic range. Think of it this way. You know, um, dynamic range in, in audio, the softer, softer, and louder, much louder. Uh, and that may, gives it the sense of realism. HDR is much the same way. It says it, got to, it has to do with black and white at the same time. Now there's many different um, or several different forms of HDR. There's HDR10, which HDR10 is pretty much the de facto standard. If it's, if it's HDR, is it gonna be encoded with HDR10? There's hybrid log gamma, which is um, a broadcast standard, which is rarely used, and, 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 um, uh, but that can be used for non-HDR displays. HDR10 plus, which is now newer and gaining ground. HDR10 plus is an encode decode system, which um, you need to have a display or panel or projector uh, that'll pull, that will decode the HDR10 plus, the metadata, and then adjust the dynamic range accordingly automatically. Uh, and that can go scene by scene. Um, and then there's also Dolby Vision, which does the same thing by frame by frame. Now it's important to note that projectors, there isn't a projector that's available um, uh, now or, or any, in the near future that is gonna be Dolby Vision, have the Dolby Vision standard because it needs a minimum of a thousand nits brightness. Now nits are, is the way high dynamic range content is measured. It's nothing more than another name for lumens, candelas, lux. It's a measure of, of light, right? Dolby Vision um, can change by the scene, 24 times a second, 30 times a second, 60 times a second, 120 times a second, depending upon the refresh rate of that content. HDR10 can change scene by scene, um, not frame by frame. But JVC developed almost two years ago now, we have a, a feature called Frame Adapt HDR that automatically looks at the metadata from that HDR content. It looks at the scene brightness from that HDR content and will automatically change that brightness for each scene and every frame, whether it's HDR 10 plus, whether it's Dolby Vision or HDR 10, it's going to do that automatically. That's called dynamic tone mapping. Dynamic meaning changing all the time. You can set that in the menu um, of the JVC projector that will allow you to have the projector automatically maximize the potential of every piece of HDR content that's played. And the examples that are on the scene uh, on the screen here, scene one, it could be very, very dark, uh, but at the same time, if it's tone mapped the correctly way, the dynamically tone map, it's going to look at the, uh, like it's on the bottom. If it's oversaturated, very, very bright, it's going to take that and, and make it look like it should um, uh, in, in uh, uh, with frame adapt HDR. And if there's dark and, uh, bright scenes in the same uh, image that is on the left, you can see how that works. Frame Adapt HDR truly is a dynamic tone mapping system that automatically works each and every time you play your projector, your JVC projector, and allows this to happen. Most brands have auto tone mapping, and auto tone mapping tone maps to the title and the title only, not to the scene, not to the frame and it doesn't do it automatically. You can do that with any projector, but you have to manually do it each and every frame and each and every scene, and it, you can't do it that way. So when we get to the install, um, there's, and, and actually before we even get to the install, we should consider how do I know if the screen in the projector is going to be far enough away because there's a thing called screen throw distance, all right? Each screen has to have a certain amount of, each projector has to have a certain amount of throw. Each screen is based on the size. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do this. If, you, if you're selling a JVC projector, go to jvc.com, go to the screen calculator, and then just pop, pop in the, the model number and it'll tell you what you need uh, for the size screen you, you have. If you're not using JVC, you wanna use some various different things. Projector Central um, has a um, uh, calcul lens calculator. Uh, projector screen calculator that works quite well. And the nice thing about projector screen, uh, uh, projector central, excuse me, dot com is that most, if not all 
projection screens or projectors are in there and you just select the projector from a drop down and it automatically calculates that. So it gives you an idea of how far the projector has to be away from the screen to fill up the screen, the minimum throw and the maximum throw for that. And then if you wanna put something on your phone, um, there's a little app called Video Calc and Video Calc will allow you to uh, put in a, you, what the, uh, you need to know what the lens ratio, throw ratios are in JVC. It's either 1.4 or uh, 1.35 uh, to 2.7 or 2.8. Um, and then also on the LXNZ3, Chris, what's the throw ratios on the LXNZ3? And uh, uh, I, I can I can help you there. Uh, 1.36 to 2.18. So it's essentially the same uh, short throw. Uh, you know, uh, but it's not, you can't go quite as far back. And the, the other thing I always ask people to remember is, you know, when you're looking at these calculators, JVC would tell you always uh, put an extra little 5% in there just as a margin for error, um, just because there, there's some slight variations to unit to unit. And then also, you know, people sometimes make a mistake on the measurements or something changes. And even just the idea that uh, uh, no lens is gonna work the absolute best at, at an extreme. So if you can move a little bit away from that extreme, generally we're only talking five or six inches, that's always gonna be better. Correct. And uh, if there's any questions you have, and at the end of this presentation, I'll be putting up my, myself, Patrick's and Chris contact information, we encourage you to call us uh, if you have any questions about uh, projector distance and throw, what size screens are gonna be work best, any of that. We'd love to be your reference for, or for all projection. We'd love for you to buy only JVC, but we know that's not realistic. Um, but at the same time, um, what is realistic is um, that we wanna be your reference uh, for the screens. Um, and we want you to purchase that from, from uh, the SNAP uh, uh, world whether it's snap through SNAP Local, snap.com. Snap um, and uh, this is a good time. Chris actually handles the snap.com account. I handle um, Value Tone and Custom Plus. And then Patrick, as he said before, handles AllNet and MRI. But it doesn't matter. Uh, if you've got a question, call one of us and we'll be happy to, to help you out with any questions that you do have uh, in regard to projection. Um, how you mount that projector, whether you put it on a table, where you put it in a soffit, uh, whether you mount it upside down uh, with a, uh, 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 a strong mount or a chief mount, it doesn't matter. Um, what's important is that that projector um, not have any pitch, tilt, or yaw to it, meaning that um, the correct way to put a projector so it doesn't have any pitch, it should be uh, parallel to the ceiling and parallel to the floor and parallel to the screen out in front. It should not be tilted down. If you tilt the projector down or if you tilt the projector up in terms of the quality of projectors that we represent here at JVC, um, you're going to have to use keystone correction. There's no reason to ever use keystone correction uh, with a JVC projector um, provided it's installed properly. Um, and one way to make sure it doesn't have any pitch on it. The other way is making sure it's not um, going to have any roll. In other words, it's not, again, not making sure that it's um, higher on the right or lower on the left. We wanna make sure that it is uh, going to be uh, parallel again to the floor and the ceiling. Uh, and then a yaw, meaning that it's not, going, it's not going to the right or to the left on a parallel surface. It's not on a pivot point. My, my friend, Chris Deutsch is doing a very nice job of being a, a Vanna, Vanna White. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and uh, it's important to, to note that uh, because when you're getting into higher end home theater projection screens, the projector um, can only do as much as the installer will allow it. So it needs to be placed parallel to the screen, parallel to the ceiling, parallel to the wall, not tilted down, tilted up, no pitch, no yaw. Everything else can be dialed in through the projector system. And the way you do that is through lens shift. Now, JVC projectors um, have, uh, DLI projectors have um, uh, 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 about, uh, anywhere between 80 to 34% uh, 
uh, vertical and horizontal lens shift or up to as much as 100% um, vertical or horizontal lens shift or vertical lens shift with 43% horizontal. What that means is it can be as high as 100% of the, from the center of the screen, whatever that is to the top of the screen and multiplying that again by a factor of two above or below the screen. Uh, JVC's lens calculator uh, will allow you to see that if you choose to use that by going again to jvc.com uh, and going to the projection screen calculator um, banner that is on the projection website. That will allow you to do that. But again, this is way lens shift will allow you to shift it up so you don't have to have it at the top of the screen or the middle of the screen. You can have it below or above the screen, wherever you choose to put it. And it doesn't have to be in the middle of the screen. Although, please, please, please try to have it in the middle of the screen in terms of the horizontal, because anytime you're uh, to the left or the right, you take away from the vertical. So if you use 10% of the horizontal lens shift, you're taking away 10% of the vertical lens shift. So it's important to try to get the center is, is important horizontally. And that way you have as much vertical as you need um, in the lens shift to make sure that you get the proper alignment on, on that. So as you can see there, um, we've talked about ultra wide solutions. Um, uh, many uh, projectors that have lens memory, not all projectors, by the way, have lens memory. In other words, if the ones that only do 16 by nine aspect ratio, there's no reason to have lens memory. Those projectors that have um, lens memory allow you to use uh, with any aspect ratio screen. What basically what it does is fills up the constant vertical height of that screen. So by example here, there's a couple examples. So in other words, a 16 by nine image on a 235, you're gonna have black bars on the left and right. Now, if you have a CinemaScope style screen and you play CinemaScope content, you're gonna fill up that entire screen with content. The black bars though, if you use lens memory, are shot above and below the screen and you don't see them at all. So therefore they're not there. So what you're doing is zooming out, making the image larger and it's filling the constant vertical height of the screen. So if you have a 16 by nine image, you're gonna have black bars on the left and right side on a, six, uh, a 235 to one screen. But think of it this way, a lot of folks think they're gonna lose image quality when they go from a flat panel um, uh, to a screen in their 16 by nine aspect ratio, not true. Here's an example, if you have a 90 inch panel and a 112 inch diagonal screen that's CinemaScope, both of those screens are 44.1 inches tall. Um, those, those screens are going to ensure that you get um, the same size height of 44.1 inches tall. So both images on a screen are going to be the same for 16 by nine. But look what happens when you play a two, three, five to one on a 16 by nine screen. You get black bars, the image is much smaller than it is on a 2351 screen. It's 75% bigger projected image when you use a 2351 con content on a 2351 image. Please utilize this, this, this information, all right? Uh, Chris's phone number, my phone number up there. Um, I very much appreciate SNAP giving JVC the opportunity to present um, Projector 101 uh, to you today. Uh, Patrick Siebert, Chris Deutsch, myself, thank you. Uh, and I believe we go over to Adam now. Is that correct? Sounds correct to me. Yeah. Um, and we'll uh, we'll save a Q and A here for um, in a moment. Okay. Yeah. So let me just run through this real quick. I'm going to run through some media distribution op options in the context of home theater. So we talked about displays. We talked about projectors. What I drive, the category I drive is how do you get content to those devices? Uh, HDMI cable makes the most sense. I actually don't own HDMI cables, but I love to talk about HDMI cables. Why wouldn't you? Um, we do HDMI cables in all sorts of uh, different lengths, 4K capable, 8K capable. Yes, we have 8K capable uh, HDMI uh, cables that I suggest you go out and get today for all of that 8K content that exists in the market. Uh, in all seriousness, though, uh, great for uh, um, planning for the future and just planning ahead for things like Xboxes and PS5s and devices like that. 8K will be the future. Eventually, we'll get here uh, and there will be content for it. 
Um, so a variety of, of standard HDMI cables as well as active HDMI cables. An active fiber HDMI cable is gonna give you greater distances uh, and allow you to maintain that signal integrity. So if you have your projector uh, much farther away uh, or in a different room even, uh, as something like an active cable may be worthwhile. Uh, in the binary brand, we also do lots of HDMI extension. So uh, we leverage HD base D along with some other categories. So we can extend HDMI as well in case uh, a standard HDMI cable is not gonna be beneficial for you in the particular uh, uh, installation that you're uh, managing. Well, I wanna talk about small form factor switches as well. So if you look at the number of HDMI inputs on a display or on a projector or even some AVRs, you may find that uh, you need to add more uh, HDMI inputs. The other value for these is discrete input selection. You know, a, 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 a customer supplied TV that doesn't have good control capabilities, maybe doesn't have discrete source selection. You can integrate a small form factor switch in the back of the TV in order to facilitate uh, discrete source selection. Um, so a lot of some, some value there as well uh, to be able to increase the HDMI input complement using small form factor switches. Uh, that's the basics for a media distribution uh, in the binary brand. Uh, what we also uh, offer, uh, we offer them in the LEAF product. Uh, we've recently introduced a product from a company called Pulsate that is a 3P product for us. Uh, it's a product that we distribute uh, under the Pulsate brand. Um, for Pulse 8, uh, and these come in 6x6, six by 8x8, six, eight by six by eight and 8x10 uh, uh, configurations. Uh, these are fixed matrix switchers. Fixed matrix switchers typically work for small to some medium-sized jobs. What I mean by a fixed matrix switcher is, so you're looking at this one, this is a 8x10 video matrix switch. There's some additional, there's four additional audio so uh, inputs, if you look at this, they call it a uh, 12 input device, uh, but it's, it's uh, an eight by 10, eight inputs, 10 outputs. Eight of those are HD base D, two of them are HDMI directly. Um, I call this a fixed matrix switcher because if I go beyond the capabilities of this, I have to replace the chassis. So not a lot of scalability here, limited flexibility. So as long as you stay within those, those constraints, it's great. But I've, I've got an eight by eight matrix switcher and I wanna drive that additional ninth display. I'm replacing that whole chassis as opposed to some technologies that we've recently introduced um, that allow us some additional flexibility. So we also have an over IP solution. So this is our MWIP product. MWIP stands for media over IP. Uh, everything sits on the network. We like to dedicate a network switch for this, but you don't have to uh, if you're comfortable setting up VLANs and things like that. Uh, but you just want to make sure that you isolate the um, MOIP data from the rest of the network as best as possible. This platform, uh, this is an ecosystem that we're building where all of these devices sit on the network. If you look from bottom to top on these, we have transmitters and receivers that do not have audio down mixing built into them. Those are the base level platform. Uh, up above those uh, are uh, transmitters and receivers that have uh, Dolby Digital and DTS down mixing in them. So I can take Dolby Digital content, uh, surround sound content and play that in the theater on my JVC projector. But I can also distribute that content to the bathroom where I have another JVC projector in the bathroom, but I've only got two speakers in the ceiling. So I've only got stereo content there. Um, so it allows you to have flexibility and share that content while getting um, your premium uh, capabilities in the theater uh, with your full surround sound. Uh, and um, in the two channel zones, I can get that same content and share it uh, across the whole installation. Uh, we also have, uh, I see JD is driving me there. We also have uh, audio only capabilities. So you can actually build with the MOIP product, uh, audio only product, a, a distributed audio system, but you can also use it as uh, an accessory in a video system where those devices can pull content off of the video transmitters and send that audio content to a, a, a disparate zone somewhere else. Um, somewhere else on the network, 
Uh, so just some added flexibility in putting these devices on the network. I, talks about, I talked about that scalability and that flexibility over a fixed matrix switcher. When you look at the capabilities of this, uh, you're limited by your network. So you can add, like if I've got a six by six system or an eight by eight system, I would have reached the limits of my matrix, my fixed matrix switcher. In MoIP, you don't have those limitations. If I wanna add an additional source, I wanna add an additional display, I'm just adding an additional receiver or transmitter onto the network switch. Uh, and that gives me the flexibility to be able to um, scale that, that project. Uh, works great from a residential perspective, uh, but also valuable from a commercial perspective as well um, to, to use to leverage that increased uh, flexibility. So that's how we move content from one place to the other in the media distribution category. Uh, there is a question, belief on using the secondary output on receivers was using more than two outputs. I found it to be finicky, I would think, because of EDID issues. So yeah, EDID kind of drives that. It really depends on your source devices. We run into the same situation with the loop out on the transmitters. So each of the MOIP transmitters has a loop output. There's basically a splitter built into that. Um, MOIP is capable of 4K30. Uh, that output will... will it's, uh, scale to 4K60, but the input is only is limited to uh, 4K30. And so uh, that puts some limitations on that. But when you're talking about uh, leveraging a loop out or the second zone output of uh, an AVR, you do need to be careful from a needed perspective. You do need to be careful um, from a signal management perspective that you're not um, going beyond the capabilities of that because a, a device is only capable of putting out a single uh, resolution at, at a time. And then you're gonna leverage scalers on the other end, like uh, MoIP has scalers built into it. So um, you can take that content and send it over the network uh, to a 4K TV and a 1080p TV. And if you have 4K content that's going out there, uh, that MoIP receiver is gonna downscale that content to 1080p for that receivers, for that display. So you're better off leveraging individual receivers uh, in order to ensure that you maintain that signal integrity. Uh, have there been improvements to resolution handling and switching speeds on the MoIP system? Resolution handling, uh, we added HDR capabilities many uh, moons ago. Uh, that was maybe six months to a year after MoIP came out. So there hasn't been any real improvements on that. Um, but from a switching speed perspective, uh, we've increased the switching speed in the context of a control four system uh, by making some changes to the way pathing works. We've increased the switching speed on the MOIP system um, for uh, uh, in, in, even in non-control four systems uh, by managing the switch time and in, in, in we, the, 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 the details aren't necessarily important, uh, but we have some new firmware that we've reduced it even further. So we're, that's in testing now. So we do have ways where we can uh, inc uh, increase that switching speed and get it to a more acceptable level. 4K60, uh, the input will not handle a 4K, the in, I'm sorry, the input is capable of handling a 4K60 input uh, just the way Just Add Power, as an example, is capable of handling a 4K60 input. The output is only 4K30, so what it will do is it will give you every other frame if you have a 4K60 signal going into it. So the answer to your question is, yes, it's capable of doing that. You could set it to 4K60 and pass that through, but you're only going to get 4K30 at the output anyway, so there's not a tremendous amount of value in doing so. And those are all my words. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions or if not, JD will wrap us up. Yeah, so um, just, you know, I, I think I wanna thank everyone here and, um, and the JVC team. Um, it's been, uh, I, you know, uh, a great couple, of, uh, couple hours with these guys, uh, also Adam and, and the rest of the team. Um, and, and, but most of all, uh, I wanna thank our partners for, uh, attending, and I hope that we, uh, you know, brought you a, a little bit of knowledge, um, and you learned a little something, 
and um, you've identified some more resources you can go to uh, for any future questions. Um, so if you have any more questions, throw them in now. If not, we'll go to wrap it up. Yeah, awesome job, guys. I mean, you're talking 200 partners today. Um, so that uh, makes me feel great that um, we're, we're, we're still on point. And, and everybody's staying uh, uh, interested, especially with the uh, specific kind of categories that we're presenting with this whole training. Jeff, way to go, man. You go deep. I love it. And uh, Patrick, thank you. Chris, thank you. Uh, JD, and also Adam, thank you so much for your expertise. You know, we're going to always continue to have Adam on here for that, for the nuts and bolts kind of presentations, buddy. Looking forward to some stuff with you guys next year. David, so let's really quickly, let's tee up what we have going next week to conclude our home theater sessions. Yeah, thanks, Gary, and thanks everyone for joining. Thanks again for the panel here for your um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant information. Absolutely, tons of good stuff in there. Um, you're gonna, by the way, you're gonna find all of these recordings on um, SnapOneWebinars.com, and Gary's gonna be sending out an email um, on Friday for you to have a catch up. So, um, like I said, last week was the audio component of our home theatre. Today, we've learned all about the video components in our home theatre system. Next week, we're gonna talk about installing it right. So. Uh, we've got we've had a bunch of great suggestions about what what we could cover in this one. One of the things that was raised was uh you know what kind of spare bits and pieces would you keep on your truck? You know when you go out to a job site, you know how how do you be efficient? What do you need um, in case of emergencies? So we're going to talk about things like speaker placement. We can do a little dive into the throw ratio question. You know one of the questions we had today was what does what do those specs really mean when it comes to the the size of the screen versus the distance between the projector and the screen? So we can go a little bit deeper into stuff like that. Um, how to calibrate, you know, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a fun one. Awesome. All right, guys, I don't see any more Q and A in the, in the queue. Uh, like David mentioned Friday morning, you're going to get a complete follow-up email with the recordings and the links, as well as, uh, all the presentations that you, you saw the slide decks, basically. I'll hey, Gary, Gary, are you going to put contact information in there? Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Could you just put my email address in there, please? Thank you. You betcha. I will not let you down, my, my, my man. Appreciate it. Guys, uh, yeah, look forward to that on Friday. And again, I cannot thank you guys enough. You know, we do this each and every Wednesday on the weekly webinar series, and that's the Snap One Locals webinar. It's all about us. It's all about what we want to talk about going into next year. As David said, we're going to do one more, and then we got a little bit of a break. But I start off on January 5th with AV Pros. I'm going to kind of change up our timings. So everybody from the East Coast, I'm starting these webinars on Wednesday at 6 a.m. Pacific. So that's 9 a.m. for you guys, and then we'll come back and follow it up at for a noontime session as well. Uh, we're all about just trying to uh, fit it within your schedules, obviously. So it's going great. Thank you, guys. I'm always here for you guys to bounce questions off of, link people together, and also for suggestions on future webinars. I love it. All right, guys, from all of us, thank you so much. We know it's busy out there. Continue to stay safe. And you got it right here with the Snap One Locals. Chris, Pat, Adam, Jeff, JD. My good friend, David. Thank you guys all. Catch you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.